Okay. So good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us uh, for this session of uh, Rose Ek Nai Kahani. Uh, well, as uh, some of you are aware that uh, Fikki sometime back uh, launched this initiative called Rose Ek Nai Kahani, where the idea is to uh, sub, uh, inculcate the habit of reading and uh, encourage uh, the overall uh, culture of reading and uh, celebrate stories. We believe that uh, there are a lot of stories around the world in every aspect and everything which we do. So the idea is to capture those stories, talk to the authors and, and celebrate those uh, stories. So under that initiative, we have been scheduling a lot of sessions uh, which, which, uh, which, which varies from in conversation with the authors, fireside chat, panel discussions and various other formats. So today's session uh, has been specifically curated uh, with two uh, very eminent authors, uh, Ms. Poonam Chavla, who has joined all the way from US and Mr. Rajesh Talwar. Uh, and with them uh, in conversation would be Ms. Lipika Bhushan. So uh, I welcome you all for this very, very interesting session. And uh, with those words, uh, I hand over the mic to Lipika. Lipika, over to you. Hi, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to another session of Rose Ek Nai Kahani. Uh, hamare paas do hai. In fact, we have two stories with us and two storytellers with us. Um, on screen, I have uh, Poonam Chavla joining us from the US and Rajesh joining us from uh, a little close uh, at Noida. So uh, welcome, both of you. Um, I would... Uh, the way we'll do this session is that I'll uh, start with introducing uh, both of the writers and then we'll get chatting. And if there are any questions, I think uh, the uh, moderators, the order organizers can help us, uh, uh, you know, address those questions that are being raised by those attending the session. Um, well, Poonam uh, was born and brought up in Mumbai and she writes extensively on women and relationships. Uh, Poonam is out with her new book, uh, The Slow Disappearing, uh, that delves deep into a very real part of our lives, uh, and that is of uh, caregiving, especially to elderly parents. Uh, she has written two other books, Mumbai Mornings, uh, which is now translated into Hindi, and uh, Sharanigans of Time. Uh, uh, I think we'll get to know more about her book a little uh, later. Uh, first, let me also introduce Rajesh Nalwar. Uh, Rajesh has 29 books, uh, which include novels, uh, children's books, plays, self-help books, and non-fiction books, uh, covering a variety of issues in social justice, culture, and law. Uh, from his novels like Simran on aesthetics and Inglistan on uh, cultural contrast, uh, to exploring themes of terrorism in uh, uh, a book like An Afghan Winter and the Sentimental Terrorist, or um, How to Kill a Billionaire that reveals the workings of the Indian judiciary system. Uh, his plays, nonfiction work, and children's books. Rajesh covers diverse contemporary themes and uh, historical uh, retellings. Um, he has, uh, in his nonfiction, uh, to his credit, the judiciary on trial, supporting uh, injustice, the Nirbhaya case, um, the killing of Arushi and the murder of justice. Uh, these are some of the case studies uh, that, you know, also highlight the flaws in our judicial system. Uh, his books and children, uh, in particular, are bestsellers. Uh, they are quite, uh, you know, liked by children. There is uh, uh, Fabulous Four and Battle of Zuzu. Uh, there's the Sleepless Beauty. Uh, and uh, uh, right now, uh, he's just come out with a new uh, fiction called Star Crossed Lovers in the Blue. Uh, we'll get talking more about that. Uh, a very interesting job profile that he has, other than uh, uh, the part of him which writes, is that of being a deputy legal advisor to the United Nations mission in Afghanistan. Uh, which is, again, uh, quite a bit in the news. But um, let's get started uh, with, uh, you know, knowing about them, uh, knowing more about their writing, uh, knowing uh, what encourages them or influences their writing, and um, take quite a few tips from them as to how we can 
if anyone wants to write how they can write better how they can become better storytellers um oh, welcome sunam welcome rajesh thank you thank you sir so good to be connected uh, with you and sunam uh, and gaurav and sumi thanks for having us right so um if i get started on the core question uh, that uh, this session was woven around and that is what has changed in the world especially in uh, with respect to relationships uh punam why don't you uh, you know answer this first go first and then we'll have to take an answer from rajesh on this what do you think has changed in the world what has changed in the world compared to what it used to be when i was growing up you mean i guess yes <laughs> okay yes <laughs> yes growing up and slowly aging uh well i think in terms of the younger people they seem to be getting more thoughtful of each other and at the same time more self sufficient uh i just look around at the children that i meet these days including my own kids and how they treat their girlfriends or their spouses and um there is a sharing of responsibility and at the same time they want to be independent it's almost like two friends living together mm -hmm. which was not the case when we were growing up uh, or when we were with our spouses there was almost a hierarchy as to who called the shots even though i was a working woman back in the 80s i still had to um bow down to the wishes of my father my brothers my various cousins and so it was a more male dominated world in that sense uh also in terms of relationships i think because of uh, social media there is a lot of connectivity the world's much smaller there's a lot of connectivity i don't know if there is a lot of connection there is a sense of isolation uh you know you can spend hours you can have a really really busy day uh doing almost nothing so uh how that affects relationships you're not going out more you know i think the sensory experience the touch experience is being lost and i think that is not very good because it is um it is through it is one of the most you know um uh, it's a form of expression that is very important so i think we are losing a little bit of that also the world is getting more intolerant you know because of the politics of the time because of uh, the the everyone has a voice in social media so it's almost like many like manufacturing outrage so every day there's a new issue and there is a huge storm about oh my god you know they are killing they are they are making they are putting elephants in the circus and then the next day it fizzles out it's almost like it's it is an event for the day and then the, you lose interest in it you want instant gratification and you lose touch with the real issues because there's always something more that you are looking at so the memory span is also gone down a little bit it's like more like short term memory people want blips it's almost like going being in advertising and looking at the slogan of the day and um which is again not very conducive to relationships rajesh in fact you write for both uh, the adult audience as well as children um what do you think of this what do you think of what's changed when i agree with you and you know that on the one hand there's a far greater connectivity uh, young people uh, can connect with somebody on the other side of the planet who has shared interests uh, but at the same time uh, people are getting young people especially millennials included they are getting uh, to lose touch with the here and now so and it's not only about bringing the mobile phone or smartphone to the dinner table uh, but uh, just getting engrossed in it seeing how many likes i'm getting how many people have shared my post uh, so uh, the here and now which is the immediate family uh, friends so you might find somebody who's a friend who's come to visit you 
and you're ignoring him because you're busy on the social media. So that's a kind of peculiar contradiction. I think uh, technology has also affected outdoor activity in the sense that uh, uh, now, for example, the Wimpy Kid. The Wimpy Kid is in a way a kind of a metaphor for how uh, children now stay at home. They are wimpy, uh, but they're still funny. It's a new kind of life. Uh, I think Corona has exacerbated this. So our changing world was being shaped by technology and suddenly we had Corona. So whereas earlier parents could have told children, hey, why don't you go out and play? Why don't you do some outdoor activity? Now, now they've been saying over the past months, stay indoors, don't go anywhere. So uh, relationships are changing. Uh, Parent-child relationships are changing. Spousal relationships are changing. Uh, I remember speaking to uh, my nephew uh, who got married just a couple of months before Corona happened. And I met him recently. I said, how's your marriage going? Are you both settling in? Are you happy? Um, and he said, yeah, you know, the thing is, Rajesh Uncle, we are together all the time. And we have... <laughs> So if we can be together all the time and be happy, uh, that's really an achievement because, and while that is good news, so some relations are working and I'm so pleased for him. On the other hand, uh, some people are finding it very difficult. In, in France, there were reports that spousal abuse had increased. Uh, Macron actually had to take charge of various private hotels where uh, uh, women who had been subjected to domestic violence could be housed. Uh, because earlier spouses would have a break from each other. Now, living together all the time can be very challenging uh, and uh, people, tempers can get frayed, uh, people can find it difficult. So, uh, so relationships are definitely been changing. And uh, as writers, uh, when we write about those relationships, and I know uh, Poonam, of course, she, um, I've had a look at her previous books and uh, uh, two books which I saw were very realistic, you know, conversations between a mother and a daughter. And so very realistic. So uh, people like her or somebody like Chetan Bhagat uh, will be affected more than uh, say Amish Tripathi, who's writing about some past historic, historical fantasy. So, uh, but now if you're writing about the current times, uh, Things are changing so much that um, your writing is also going to be affected. Um, that brings so to a very important. Uh, in fact, you brought this uh, brought up uh, brought up a very important point about how writers get affected about from from what's changing around them, and that's where lies the uh, you know the point about power of observation. Um, how uh, a writer. Uh, absorbs what's happening around him or her and then uh, puts it out on paper uh, for the rest of the world to read. Uh, how do you focus your observations around uh, human relationships and still try and keep yourself away in the sense, uh, observe it as an outsider, uh, observe episodes and incidents as an outsider and yet not get as affected in order for you to uh, not be able to balance your characters well? Is that a challenge that you face in the first place? I mean, uh, yes, I think, I think uh, uh, you know, uh, I think Amitabh Bachchan said in an interview uh, recently uh, that every writer is also an actor because you're writing about different characters, then you have to get into the skin of the character. So this affected me a lot in my how to kill a billionaire book. So I used to pace around the room, getting into the skin of the character. Uh, but then when you shift characters, then you're getting into the skin of another character and you have to be neutral in that sense. You have to be involved, but then, uh, uh, but I have to say also that the writing process has been affected because if you take the novel format, you will have the dialogue, you will have the, the theme, you will have the narrative voice, but you'll also have settings. So, uh, and settings uh, entrance the reader. Uh, if, if you're meeting, if a, 
romantic couple is meeting in the park in the mountains, then the park will be described, the flowers will be described, the mountains will be described, the climate will be described. But now everybody is meeting on Zoom. So how much do you observe on a Zoom that the chair was leather or it was, uh, you know, <laughs> vaccine? Uh, so, so I think uh, uh, this uh, uh, changing world has, has really uh, impacted uh, the process of writing as well. Puram, in fact, you, uh, uh, you know, you deal with a very uh, emotionally challenging subject in your latest book. Uh, and that's about a caregiver who's uh, reluctant, who doesn't want to uh, take care of her uh, mother-in-law. I mean, it's a very interesting setting. Usually it's like the parents that you would have expected, but it's here, it's a mother-in-law. And uh, the husband also doesn't have time, but uh, by way of, or maybe for the reasons of loving him, she's continuing to uh, help out. And in the process, uh, uh, there's, a, there's this entire... A journey that she embarks upon uh, with different relations in the family. And it's a very close, I mean, it's, it's, it's a story which uh, picks on each character separately in your chapters and then takes it forward from there. How do you uh, perceive, uh, you know, how do you keep away from really getting affected? How, how, how does that work for you? in order for you to give that equal weightage to everyone in the, if, if we read the book, uh, there's, there's equal weightage given to every character. So it's not like one person is the protagonist and the hero and the rest of them just happen to be around in order to develop the story. So how do you uh, work around that? Uh, yeah, so th the book does have four different points of view. Um, and at the start, I show that my characters, each one of them is very self-absorbed. It's almost as if my own background has made me this person and I'm going through this pain and my pain takes precedence over everybody else's. So there is very little empathy for the other members of the family uh, or, or other relationships. But as they mature, uh, in terms of, uh, for instance, the care um, giver, who is Anika, uh, she starts seeing, when the mother-in-law actually gets within her sphere of vision, at first she's very involved with her own life. She has work, she has home, she's running around and everything is done in the moment. But when she quits work and takes care of her mother-in-law, she, she actually gets in a field of vision and she starts seeing her as a real human being. She also sees that I am aging myself and somewhere on some future canvas, this is going to be me. So in the end, I think every, every book that one writes is also a journey within. It's also about empathy. It's about understanding, which, which I believe is the seed, seed form of love or happiness. Once you, start, once you start unifying and identifying with the character and stepping into their shoes, you see that, you see, you know, it, it becomes easier. Then you, take, you get away from dutifulness. You start, think, you don't think of it as a Lakshman Rekha between you and your private yearnings. It's more about, hey, this is a, per, this is a real person. She, this is not somebody who I just take out for grandparents day or take her out for show and tell. She has a background and she can, I, I can actually learn from her. And there are so many good qualities about so-and-so person. And if I can get some, acquire some of those, it will probably be more beneficial for me. And in the end, if you can make that leap and, and, and do start empathizing with that person, it goes from beautifulness and it becomes a privilege. It's a learning experience and it's a very long curve and I'm not there yet, but it is, it is a good, it's a good thing. At this point, can I ask you to maybe read a bit from your book and then I'll come to Rajesh in continuation to what you said. Oh, sure. I can do that. I have to just figure out uh, which excerpt would be. I can read about, um, uh, this is um, Anika, the, the, the caregiver's um, version, and she's talking about herself. This is when um, 
she goes to a support group, I think, and she is basically venting. And it's on 250. So she is on, um, she's at a support group where she's, uh, some, somebody has convinced her to go and join and, you know, listen to people and their stories and, you know, maybe that would help. So she goes into that and she says, I cook, I clean, I monitor, chug, chug, chug. That is the sound of tedium, I said. Of course, there are times I'm still happy. Don't get me wrong. I still read, although not at a stretch binge watch Netflix in the middle of the night and I invite close friends over for a chili cookout. And there are times when I'm truly grateful. She keeps me humble, you see, grounded. It's like being allowed a peek inside some future mirror and nodding to the person one might become down the road. But then I hear music drifting from a party across the street or the wind rustling through the trees or a goldfish rocking madly from branch to branch. And I'm filled with hatred for my life and for her. Then there are times when I have a headache or it burns when I pee or I have a cold I cannot shake and I'm fully aware how petty that is. But what is a cold when one is losing words or losing a foothold on one's surroundings? And that is when I detest the sound of a phlegmy cough, the dentures gaping on the sink, a pee trail on the bathroom floor, the applesauce, the color of excreta and the never ending pills, the overdrawn drama, the plastic face of Pat Sajak on TV, or the deafening canned revelry of game shows and her passive aggressive silences. So this is basically her ambivalent feelings towards a mother-in-law and having to take care of her. In fact, you know, Poonam made a very important point about uh, the journey within, and which needs depth. Uh, and uh, while you write uh, for all, all age groups, how do you, and since you write also for children and young adults, how do you think they will be able to take the burden of relationships forward and get this depth to understand uh, they're restless, they're young, uh, but they are in a very different era than ours. And uh, we're also talking about people who will be tomorrow shaping the writing community. They will be writing for our future. How do you, how do you, how do you think that this step and this journey within that one needs to take as a writer uh, will be taken by them? Well, I think uh, each one has their own journey. You know, each one is different, uh, but it is a, it is. To a large extent, a parent's responsibility to monitor the growth of and development of a child, to not only see, to make them more rounded individuals, to not only see that they're academically wonderful or they're athletic, but also that they're more loving and caring human beings. You know, uh, volunteer. Do you want to, yeah, sorry, sorry. I was just going to say volunteerism is very, very. Um, uh, you know, e easy to do in this country at least. And I think that helps a child a lot. You know, it gets them to see other, other people and how they live and uh, how it's important to live in a world that is not just me, me, me. It's right. also about us. Right. Rajesh, how would you like to add to that? Uh, well, I think I'll take uh, uh, the ambivalence which Puna mentioned. Uh, and reference it to uh, uh, my most recent book, Star-Crossed Lovers in the Blue, uh, which I think can be a good read for millennials, uh, because uh, as Puna mentioned, uh, youngsters are living in a very different world. And sometimes uh, uh, they need to take advice and they may not have complete faith in their parents that they'll be able to give them advice because they think, well, they were living in a different world. Our challenges are different. Uh, of course, there are online resources they can turn to, to friends, but I think uh, they can also turn to books, um, which will give them an idea uh, of different situations faced by characters, how they overcome them. Uh, they'll be able to relate uh, to situations. Um, my 
latest uh, novel, Star Crossed Lovers, Arj is actually uh, quite ambivalent in the beginning about whether Uthir, the mermaid, uh, since this is all about the merfolk community living in the oceans, um, whether she has betrayed him or whether she has succumbed to parental pressure because she ends up marrying somebody else. And then, uh, but his trust is not shaken. Uh, so the book focuses in the beginning on the importance of trust in a relationship. And he travels across the world's oceans to try and meet her at the other side of the world and convince her uh, that she should come away with him. Uh, then he undertakes all these travels, but he matures uh, in the process. And then he starts to think, is it such a good idea? Uh, Uthir is already married. Possibly she has a family. Uh, maybe it's not such a good idea for me to ask her to come with me. And he changes his mind. So, uh, so there are a lot of conflicting emotions. Uh, one of the reviewers described the novel as a roller coaster of emotions. And I think uh, uh, such an emotional ride uh, can, also, can be very entertaining, uh, but also there are some lessons in it where um, uh, the readers, in this case, the book is targeted more at millennials, uh, they can draw lessons uh, which may be useful for them in their own lives. At this point, would you like to read a bit from your book? Uh, before you do that, let me just uh, introduce a bit about the star cross lovers in the blue uh, to the rest of the attendants, uh, people who are attending the session. Uh, it's about, uh, it's a story of heartbreak and hardships of two long lost lovers. Um, and interestingly, they are uh, mer they are from the merfolk. Uh, there's a mermaid, uh, Utir and Arj, who's the merman. And uh, while uh, they are deeply in love and they are not, they don't end up getting married. Uh, and uh, after years of separation, they come back and meet each other and, um, uh, you know, uh, they encounter each other and again, try to, uh, you know, revive that old love. Uh, but what's important is that uh, uh, the point about, uh, you know, which has been included is about a Corona-like epidemic that's, uh, that affects everyone there. And while the story is about love, it's about uh, rekindling uh, your lost uh, you know, emotions for each other. It is also about a larger issue of ecology, of our dying ecology, of how it's important for us humans to take care of it. Yeah, Rajesh, would you like to read uh, from the book, please? Uh, thanks. Uh... Lipika, that was an excellent introduction. And I think just before I uh, start to read uh, on the relationship aspect, uh, thank you for mentioning the ecology aspect. Uh, there are a couple of instances in this book where uh, the merfolk interact with human beings. Uh, some, somebody asked me recently, well, do they ever get to know about us? Uh, so I'd just like to mention a few things uh, in that context, and then I'll read a bit. Uh, Yes, they do uh, have an interface. In fact, Arj and Uthir, they first meet when they're both exploring outer space. So they're both of an adventurous sort and they want to see what is there above the water. Uh, all governments have forbidden them to explore because they say there's a strange creature uh, with uh, no tail, looks very monstrous uh, and it's better to avoid him. Uh, and then there is uh, uh, there's an incident where Arj goes above the surface of the water and he sees two sharks traveling at great speed. And that's actually a reference to 9-11 with the aeroplanes, you know, seen from a Murpho perspective. So, uh, and finally, uh, the ecological issue is highlighted where you have a merman with two heads and he has these two heads because humans have been dumping chemical waste into the ocean and they polluted the waters. And uh, his mother drank some of those waters and these kind of things happening. So uh, it's a time to reflect 
uh, on what we are doing to the planet, what we are doing to each other. Uh, finally, I would say the merfolk managed to tackle the uh, coronavirus with the uh, great uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, they have their uh, problems, uh, but maybe there is something uh, that human beings can take a lesson from. Uh, so that's, uh, that's about the other aspects of the book. And maybe I can just read uh, a few paragraphs. I think I'll just read the section where Arj is confused about uh, whether to believe or not to believe. He had been so confident that Urtir loved him just as he loved her. But he saw now that he had been wrong. He had thought that they understood each other's minds and thoughts, but he had been under an illusion. She had simply been toying with him. She had cheated and deceived him. This is what one part of his brain said to him. Urtir knew how he felt about her, he told himself. She had listened so patiently and lovingly to all the poems that he had written about her. Even if she hadn't loved him in return, Although till her marriage, she could have sworn that she did. Shouldn't she have at least come back from the wedding and explained her decision to him? And she had kissed him before she left. Surely that must count for something. In Runwa, even today, it means something when a mermaid kisses a merman on the lips. It was not a friendly peck on the cheek that a sister might give to her brother or a parent to their offspring. Surely it had been more than that. Deep down in his heart of hearts, he trusted her. He knew that she was not really a gold digging mermaid and that she possessed high values. This was part of the reason that he loved her so much. But then why or oh why had she married that rich two headed merman? Was there a way to find out? Uh, so, so this is his ambivalence. He cannot make up his mind, but still deep down he trusts her and he travels the oceans to try and meet her and convince her that uh, she should come away with him. But as he travels, he matures and he realizes things are not so simple. Uh, he starts thinking less like an adolescent and more like an adult. So I'll come to that section now. Arj had become a travel journalist with the plan of somehow reading, reaching Cuba and being reunited with Uthir. That was the original idea. But during the course of his travels, he had matured and now he was doubtful if it was proper or even honorable for him to try and convince Uthir to leave her married house and come away with him. It was not right to break up someone's marriage, he told himself. Now that Uthir was happily married, how could he ask her to come away with him? No, he told himself, the very idea was fantastic and he must have been maddened or crazed by love to have even considered that it was workable. And Uthir might have children by now. Would it be fair to ask her to abandon them and come away with him? But he would like so much to see her, even if briefly. No, no, he thought again, it would only cause him pain to see how happy she was in her new surroundings. She would surely have forgotten all about him by now and be immersed in her new life. So he changes his mind, but then fortune throws them together again. Uh, and whether they will be reunited, uh, I don't want to give any spoilers. So. <laughs> no, but something that I think everyone in love has uh, experienced uh, once in a while. Um, when I'm coming to your book, uh, you do uh, capture uh, a journey not just that of uh, relationships between people in the family, but also a journey from pre-partition India to the, today's US. And uh, it also talks about the sandwich generation, you know, that saw that time and is now seeing today's India in the US. Uh, and it's, it's a disturbing so story for this family, but, uh, you know, 
what is it that you think um, and I, I, I would first like to understand how much of it comes from real life experience. Uh, and secondly, what do you think has changed? It talks about that vast change that has happened in those many decades. So pre-partition time, yes, it, uh, I do know, I heard a lot about it growing up because both my parents uh, were from that era. My father was from Lahore and my mother was from um, Karachi and Quetta. She was kind of between those two places. And uh, like, obviously when they left uh, those um, uh, and they came to India, when they came uh, in, in the partitioned India, uh, their lives changed a lot. Uh, they had grown up in, I really don't know whether their lives were perfect. Obviously they were not, but they, because they could never go back, they tended to think of it as some sort of a utopia that they could never get back to. And uh, they were thrown from a sort of a village, a close community kind of existence to a big city. Uh, kind of the way I felt when I came from Mumbai to USA. You know, you don't have the foundation of family. You don't have friends. You don't have the community that you grew up with. Everyone around you is somebody else. You know, I used to look at soaps and say, oh, this, this, this actor reminds me of that actor in India. You know, so every, my, the whole frame of reference is the past. And so there is a reluctance on your part to actually accept the present because you're looking, living so much in the past. And that actually affects your relationships with everybody around you. You want things to be the way they were or at least a semblance of what they were. So you're not able to see the person in front of you, how he's growing up, where he or she is growing up, what their lives are like and how you are supposed to adapt yourself to these circumstances rather than dwell in the past. So obviously, although there's a lot of nostalgia, there's a lot of grief you know, you are, you, there is something that you can never get back to. And then there is the question of rebuilding. So all those things affected their relationships and mine and everybody else's, you know. Now in this session, let's come to the part on writing skills. Um, uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people in those attending the session who would want to know that some very basic questions about how to add layers to your characters or how to even begin writing. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of us face this challenge. I mean, how should we, where to start and what to consider uh, good enough to uh, take it forward in the form of books. I'm sure there are many times where you all, you both would also have uh, faced situations where you wrote something and then you dumped it in between. And then you went back to it years later and you know you thought, okay, I could still give it some shape. So Rajesh, why don't we start from you first? Uh, what are the tips that you would like to give to people who are looking at writing, who uh, would like to write um, a variety of, on a variety of subjects, um, uh, you know, ranging from what uh, their professional life uh, allows them or exposes them to and uh, to what their personal life Exposes them to. Um, uh, thanks, Lipika. I think, uh, of course, it would depend uh, uh, on the wannabe writers out there who are listening into this program, uh, what kind of genre they want to uh, write in, uh, and how serious uh, is the material that they want to write on. Uh, so, I think. Uh, uh, I'm a great ad admirer of some of the French and Russian writers. In particular, somebody uh, I greatly admire for the way he gets into the skin of his character, this uh, gentleman called Turgenev. And uh, people used to ask him, your character is so real. Is he modeled on somebody? Uh, because of course, if you model it on a real life person, then the character will appear real. Uh, but Turgenev's characters were not modeled on anybody. So that was, uh, they were a creation. Uh, so, and they asked him, what is the process of writing? He says, well, I, you know, just focus on creating the characters and then I let them loose. And then the, they decide where to take the story. Uh, so 
uh, I have written personally books in both genres. Um, so, and in both styles. Uh, there are some books I have written where I don't know what's going to happen next. So you start and then the characters take you along and the book writes itself, so to speak. Uh, but there are other, there are other uh, books, for example, some of my plays where I map, up, map out everything in advance. So I know this is a historical play. These are the events. This is how I'm going to assemble it. Uh, so actually, even before I start the process of writing, I have a blueprint in my mind. Uh, I think uh, both ways of writing have their own advantages and strengths. Uh, although I would probably say that, uh, you know, in, in writers, they talk about a muse, that sometimes the muse is involved. Uh, and the muse is possibly more involved when you write by instinct, when, you, when you're not planning it out. Uh, but that is, of course, uh, uh, quite challenging uh, and you have to allow yourself to be led uh, by how the characters shape their story so uh, if that's useful to anyone i would request everyone who's listening in to maybe leave their questions in a message box and i can take those up as we go ahead uh how about you your characters from the book uh, you know especially this one that i've read um, has a lot of layers in it. And uh, we all are complicated human beings, but how do we bring out that complex in our writing? Uh, share a few tips about how you began writing and how uh, you've evolved uh, now, you have, now that you have about three books to your credit. Well, uh, I think the first thing I learned was to read. And the more you read, the more better you can write. Grammar is important. Vocabulary is important. Ambience is important. And you, can, you, you have to work at your craft. You have to work at it religiously. You can't just pen something. You can't think in one language and write in another language. You have to start thinking in the language that you want to write in. Observation is very important I, in, to my mind, you know, to just observe human nature. Uh, get out of your own head and observe what somebody else is doing and what somebody else is. And listening is the same side of the coin. So what happens very often is even as you're speaking, I'm framing an answer, I'm framing a response, which is not the right, in my mind, is not the right thing to do. You want to hear a person out to the end, make that your mantra. In fact, listen to the person. Listening and observing is what helps you to write. And of course, you have to want to write it badly enough. It has to be a passion. If you don't want, if you make excuses, no, not today, or it's too hard, or today's not the right day, today I'm busy, then you don't want it badly enough, you know? And otherwise, I think, yeah, that's what I tell everybody around. When my kids were little, I used to keep books in, in, the, in the washroom. I used to keep books everywhere to encourage, so that somewhere, somehow they'll pick up a book and they'll read. So, you know, and some of it is just, um, yeah, empathy again is very important. Uh, if you want to delve into your characters, you have to, you have to learn to, <clears throat> to watch them regularly, you know, study them. You know, if you're in an airport, if you're in a hotel lounge, if you're in a, in a park, just observe human behavior. I remember going to a July 4th, um, uh, you know, fireworks display. And I missed the entire display because I was so, so fascinated by the tableau in front of me by three people. There was a young married couple and there was a girl who was probably the, the young woman's sister who seemed to be in love with the girl's husband. And I, kept, I just was so fascinated by it. And it became, I actually wrote a story in it years later. So uh, everything helps and it's all in there in the, in the brain's amygdala, which is, I guess, the seat of emotions, not only what you observe, but what the feelings that are aroused in you, it's all in there. You just have to document it. Well, uh, thank you so much for sharing both those, um, you know, your, from, from your personal experiences, how uh, one can really practice writing better. 
um, I'm I'm glad that you know I've had the opportunity to uh, read both your books, <laughs> and um, I have them. I have the copies with me, and uh, these are very nice and I know, believe <laughs> covers that uh, that have been uh, done for the books. Um, uh, well, thank you so much for your time. I I think uh, you know we are uh, heading towards the end of the session. Um, I would really uh, uh, recommend uh, that you know I mean if you can uh, do continue to uh, uh, you know share lots and lots of tips for young people to start writing. Uh, not just tips about writing, but about generally um, absorbing from the uh, from the environment around it. You know, one has to be very sensitive to those things. And as you very rightly put, uh, Poonam, it's also about how you bring up your children uh, and how, how that's how, that, that what, that's what defines uh, how they are going to be and how sensitive they are going to be to their surroundings. Um, well, thank you again, uh, Rajesh. Uh, thank you, Poonam, uh, for joining us. Um, uh, thank you, Piki, for um, hosting this session. I think, uh, I hope uh, everyone who's attending the session has, is, is taking away something good from it. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll continue to look forward to, you know, doing these more of, often so that we can do, we can bring in more writers and bring in more perspectives. Uh, thank you, Sumit. Uh, thank you, Sumit, for arranging this. Thank you, for, thank you to your team for uh, putting this uh, together for us. Thank you, Lipika. Thank you so much. In fact, uh, it was an excellent conversation and I enjoyed every bit of it. And I'm sure there was a lot of takeaway for all our uh, attendees uh, from this session. And uh, definitely I'm going to pick up both the books. Uh, I found very, very interesting when you read uh, two, three paragraphs from your respective books. So I really enjoyed that. So uh, <laughs> definitely, at least from my side, I'm definitely going to pick up those books. And uh, what, what, what is important during the conversation was the, were the questions which you uh, sort of, uh, Lipika, you uh, put across to both the authors on about the style of writing and how to write and how to get actually into the, if I may, if I may uh, say in the language of Rajesh, get in the skin of the character, right? So I really enjoyed that. So, and I'm sure um, uh, all our uh, attendees would have equally uh, enjoyed this. So thank you once again, uh, uh, Poonam and Rajesh for joining us. And thank you, Lipika. For, uh, for an excellent conversation. And we really, really look forward to uh, many more such sessions. Thank you so much and have a great Thank evening. You. Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you, Sumit. Thank you, Lipika. It's been a wonderful session. I think Lipika has an alternative career if she wants to go that way because she hosts these sessions uh, so wonderfully and with so much empathy, something which Puna mentioned. So, so great to be here uh, with uh, you, Sumit, Lipika, Poonam, and Gaurav. Uh, thanks very much and look forward uh, to engaging once again in some months. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I mean, you could have done anything else, but you took that, you made the time to do this, and I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye.